more good singing. I tell you, we were blessed today. A uh, good day of worship. Uh, we started out great in Sunday school, as always, and then moved on in here to the worship service, and God came down and blessed. And I tell you what, preacher, I know uh, I appreciate uh, your heart. I thank you for loving us the way that you do. And we'll bring the word to the way that you do, and we don't get preaching, and people don't hear preaching like that, sadly, to say uh, everywhere. Uh, we ought to, but uh, we're fortunate and blessed, and we want to thank God uh, for it and, and the good music that, that we have from our choir and our folks that do our special singing. And as um, we'll say a little bit later on, you pray for Miss Melissa tonight as she comes in a little bit to sing a special for us. But it's uh, just been a good day in the Lord, and thank you for coming back tonight. Uh, you're the, the, the backbone of the church, so to speak, and there's others that can't get out because the, they're just not able to bear the cold or they're uh, sick and afflicted in, in, in body and have some things wrong and would love to be here. Uh, but thank you for being in your place uh, tonight and encouraging, uh, encouraging us. So welcome, welcome back to Union Grove Baptist Church. We, we got a, a large prayer list and it's being added to and sometimes minutes <laughs> it gets added to here on Sunday uh, and it's surely all week long but do remember those that have uh, the flu and the colds and um, even several that have pneumonia some of them are listed for you in your prayer sheet others aren't uh, but uh, they do have uh, some serious things that are going on in their life mention a few again as we did this morning Terry Austin if you would remember brother Terry as he has uh, upcoming surgery on the 30th uh, Esther Bowman, again, upcoming surgery on the 23rd. Um, Joyce Curtis, and uh, now Miss Joyce had a bad fall and um, was took, taken to Winston, uh, got checked out there and then uh, didn't break anything. And, but they did make an appointment for her uh, because she did not do well at home uh, after she got discharged there. Uh, she has seen a neurologist I uh, don't know the results or what they're going to do with that uh, yet. So she's just not feeling well at, at all. So just pray for her and Brother Jay. They're just sweet people. Susan Denning recovering uh, from, from surgery that she had this past week. So remember her. Uh, also, Joe Gibbs Sr. Hopefully, hopefully we'll get to have the heart surgery that he needs on the 17th. He, he is, and his good wife uh, are sick. And so we're still waiting to decide, uh, as, as uh, Joe uh, Jr. said, uh, uh, to see if they're going to let them have that uh, surgery or not. So the plan is for, for this coming Wednesday. So I uh, pray that that be God's will that that can take place. Uh, Miss Rhonda Gregg, and she has not been with us in all, over a month and probably a month and a half, nearly two months now. And she has some serious respiratory problems um, that are going on, some pneumonia and bronchitis, a lot, just a lot of things going on all at once. She can't even leave her home uh, right now, the way that the treatment that they're giving her. And uh, we're trying to touch base with her each week, and um, she just appreciates very much your prayers, misses being here uh, at church with us. Keaton Greer, upcoming shoulder surgery. Um, also, Miss Gail Lilly uh, at Share Center was at, at Caldwell today could be going back to the share center as early as tomorrow um so and, and she's just she's in a lot of pain but having a lot of respiratory problems too and they probably sent her over there to get some treatment so uh, just just be much in prayer for her um and then uh, donna lovins of course continuing to pray for her on her recovery from knee replacement may mccall still at share center uh recovering from fall and strokes also, Miss Judy Pope uh, has been moved uh, to Carolina Rehab Center and seemed to be, as Brother Don said, he went over there to check on her today, and they're pretty happy with where they're at right now. And so hopefully and we'll prayerfully, uh, the Lord will bless, and she'll get well enough to, to come back home. She desires to be here and worship with you good folks and appreciates your prayers very much. Jerry Robertson recovering from cataract surgery and has upcoming gallbladder surgery in February. Reed Roper recovering from a ruptured disc and he had back surgery and that's the spouse of Andrea Biddix. Uh, Wade Silvers recovering from throat surgery. 
um, Nancy Swink, uh, recovering from some surgeries she's already had, doing well, but has some cataract surgery uh, ahead of her. So if you would remember her. And then Ashton Hensley with uh, kidney stones, if you would remember uh, her. We have Troy Cannon. We have an update on Brother Troy. Um, he is at home. Uh, after being at Duke and having some complications after his heart transplant surgery, and Brother Rex Cannon said that he is at home. So we praise the Lord for that. Continue praying for Kenneth Coffey in ICU, recovering from complications after bypass surgery is septic, and that's a very dangerous situation for him. That's a nephew of Lois Andes, also Leonard Hall, upcoming surgery next week. This is the father of Lorena Foster. And uh, then Richard Bradshaw recovering from heart cath and stents that were placed. That's the brother of Gary Bradshaw who's in our Sunday morning crowd each and every week. Uh, Evelyn Curtis and kidney stones and very ill. The sister of Helen Poole uh, and aunt of Regina Jones. Also Megan Dula uh, at uh, Carolina Medical delivered a baby, but baby is in ICU and mom has had two emergency surgeries since giving birth, and this is a cousin of Jeff Foster, so if you would pray for Megan and her newborn. Um, had several, a couple of notes of sympathy for you, the Jim Mitchell uh, and his family at the death of his sister, and also the, the, the family of Faye Kirby. This is uh, Melanie Hampton's mother who passed away on Friday night uh, late. She will be receiving, they will be receiving for her friends at Pendry's on Wednesday, at 1 p.m. and then the funeral will follow at 2 p.m. So just be much in prayer for Miss Melanie uh, and her family. Um, several things there for you to, to remember uh, as well as our military folk and their families and our missionaries uh, and their families. Pray for those that as we said they'll be leading us in worship and also always as we say pray for Brother Sam that God will use him to bless us and help us uh, tonight as he preaches the word of God to us. So let's go to the Lord in a time of, of prayer. Brother Tom Brookshire, will you pray for us today, sir? Amen. Thank you, brother. Let's all stand. Turn to hymn number 252. Down at the cross. Let's stand and sing together. Glad you're back. 
Thank you very much. <laughs> Now let's all stand again. Turn to hymn number 107, Love Lifted Me. Let's stand and sing together. Sing out strong.
It's already been said, thank you, thank you for your effort and being out here on a cold Sunday night. And I pray God would bless your effort. Let's bow our heads and hearts for offertory prayer. Mark Barlow, would you lead us, please? place that's called heaven it's made for the pure and the free these truths in God's word he hath given how beautiful heaven must be how beautiful for heaven must be sweet home of the happy and free fair haven of rest for the weary how beautiful heaven must be waters of life they are flowing and all who will drink may be free rare jewels of splendor are glowing how beautiful heaven must be Melissa for the special singing choir again. Thank you for the good singing on Sunday morning and Sunday night and thank you for being faithful on Sunday night. Again I remind you you have a copy of my outline 
The title of my message tonight is The Return of the King of Kings. The Return of the King of Kings. Please take your Bible. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter number 9. And please uh, take a copy of God's Word. You're going to get much more from uh, God's Word than you will from the preacher tonight. Follow along. The Bible has much to say about the subject that we're looking about into tonight. The second coming of Christ is a central theme of much of the Bible. Christians can rest assured in the same conviction that Jesus Christ came to earth the very first time He will return at the conclusion of the Great Tribulation. We must not confuse the second coming of Jesus Christ with the rapture. Now I know that you folks know the difference. A lot of people get that confused. The rapture takes place seven years before the tribulation. Jesus comes, but you know, you have read, Christians meet Him in the air. He does not put His feet on the earth. As King of Kings, when He comes back, the second coming, He comes back to earth a second time. He comes with all of His armies. He comes with all authority. He comes to make all things right. I'm looking forward to that, aren't you? The Bible clearly teaches us that Jesus is coming back to this earth again. Look with me please. Hebrews chapter 9 at verse 27 and verse 28. The Bible says in verse 27, And it is appointed unto man once to die. We all are going to die unless the rapture happens during our lifetime. Do we agree? We better be ready. Better be ready, have to be ready, need to be ready. But after this, the judgment. So Christ was, uh, was once offered, referring to the cross, to Calvary. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Unto them that look for him shall, be appear, shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Now if you would turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, look at verse number 21. Some people want to know how bad will these years really be. Verse 21 says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should not be. There should not flesh be saved, but the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Now we know, as we look in the book of Revelation, we have studied that, and we know that during, and I'm trying to paint you a picture of an awful scene, that uh, during the tribulation, half, now think about this, half of the population of the earth will be destroyed. Now that's a big number today, is it not? And the population continues to grow and continues to grow. And also it tells us in the book of Revelation on another occasion, a fourth of the population will be destroyed. All this during those seven years of tribulation. We ponder that question, when will this happen? Look with me if you still have your Bibles open in Matthew uh, chapter 24 at verse 36. The Bible, Jesus is speaking, He says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. If you'll skip down to verse 42, we find a warning. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. We know He's coming. We know He's coming. We're not sure exactly when. Verse 36 and 42 are referring to the rapture. When Jesus comes in the air. When the living Christians meet Jesus Christ in the air. We don't know when the rapture will occur. But it will happen. Amen? The rapture, then seven years of tribulation. Then what? In chapter 24, look at verse 29. The Bible says in verse 29, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened. Try to imagine this picture. Shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven. And the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. All these things will take place at Christ's second coming back here at earth. Let's bow together 
and pray together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the blessings of the day. We do thank you for the protection of the day. We thank you, God, for health and strength of the day. God, we have a long prayer list. Many that have had surgery, many that are going to have surgery. We have some that have lost loved ones. I do pray, God, for each one of those that Jeff mentioned just a short time ago. Lord, intervene. I do pray that you would bless those names that were mentioned. God, help us tonight to realize just a little bit more about the rapture and to realize a little bit more about the second coming, God of your Son, Jesus Christ. Bless those that are here. It's a cold night, God, and you know much more about that than I do, but you know these are your people and they love you. And I just pray you'd bless them in a special way for their faithfulness. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, nothing could be more dramatic than the contrast between our Lord's first coming and His second coming. I want to give you some examples. In His first coming, Jesus was wrapped in swaddling clothes. In His second coming, He will be clothed in a robe dripped in blood. In His first coming, He was surrounded by cattle and common people. In His second coming, He will be accompanied by the massive armies that He has in a place called heaven. In His first coming, the door of the inn was closed to Him. We heard the words, no room. In His second coming, the door of heaven will be open specially for Him. In His first coming, His voice was a tiny voice, the cry of a little baby. In His second coming, His voice will thunder as the sound of many waters. I believe this, and I may be wrong, that His voice will be heard over the entire world. I believe that. In, in His first coming, He was the Lamb of God who came to bring salvation. In His second coming, He will be the Lion of Judah who comes to bring judgment. Two questions. Are you ready for His return? He's coming. I wish I could tell you when, but it's good enough to know that we have His promise, that we have His Word that He's coming. And are you ready to stand before God? Before I get too far in my sermon, I want to give you some differences in the rapture and the second coming. Just listen. uh, Most of you already know this, but it's just amazing to hear the differences. At the rapture, translation of all believers. At the second coming, no translation at all. At the rapture, Christians leave earth and go to heaven. At the second coming, the Christians return to earth. Those that are in heaven come back with Jesus. At the rapture, earth is not judged. At the second coming, earth is judged. Righteousness will be 100% established. At the rapture, it affects believers only. At the second coming, it affects all humanity. At the rapture, there's no references, none at all, to the old devil, to Lucifer. At the second coming, we find in God's Word that the old devil is bound for a thousand years. At the rapture, Christ comes for His very own. At the second coming, Christ comes with His very own, with His children, with His church. At the rapture, He comes in the air. At the second coming, He comes back and puts His feet on earth. At the rapture, He claims His bride. At the second coming, He comes with His bride. At the rapture, only His own see Him, those that know Him personally. At the second coming, every eye, every eye all over the earth will see Him. Now, how can we know Jesus will return? Look at your outline. I'll give you four references. The announcement, Roman numeral number one, the announcement of His return. The announcement. References to the second coming, outnumber reference to the first coming. Listen to this number, by a factor of 8 to 1. 8 to 1. Bible scholars count 1,845 biblical reference to the second coming, including in the New Testament 318 references. I want to give you reference number 1 under Roman numeral number 1. Many Old Testament prophets wrote concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ. If your writing is not, pencil in the word prophets. Let me give you reference from the book of Zechariah, chapter number 14. Reference number 1, Zechariah 14, beginning in verse number 3. The Bible says, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when He fought in the day of battle. 
and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. Now, note how Zechariah deals in specifics, even pinpointing the location in which Jesus Christ, when he leaves heaven and comes back to earth, where he will stand, where he will return. Reference number two, Jesus himself announced his second coming. Matthew 24, verse 27 says this, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even into the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. If you're looking with me in Matthew, skip down to verse 29. The Bible says in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, and we've read these verses again, but I want you to get this picture in your mind. Shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Reference number three, the angels announced that Jesus would return. Immediately following Christ's ascension to heaven, you were very familiar with this scripture, I'm sure. Two angels appeared to the disciples and spoke the words of comfort. Acts 1.11 says which also said, You men of Galilee, why stand you gazing into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall come, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Now, if you still have your Bibles open, turn with me to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter number 1. Reference number 4, John foretold Jesus' second coming. John foretold, Revelation chapter 1, verse number 7. Now remember there's 845 references. Excuse me, there's 1,845 references. Verse 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. Look at your outline. Notice Roman numeral number 2. The open door of His coming. A lot of people read this and read this and they never really dawn on them that heaven's opening up the door. The open door of His coming. Twice in the book of Revelation we're told that the door of heaven will be open. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 4. It first opened to receive the church into heaven at the time of the rapture. Revelation 4.1 says, After this I looked and behold a door was open in heaven. Now turn with me to Revelation 19. The door is opened a second time for Christ and His church to proceed from heaven on their march back to earth. The first open is for the rapture of the saints. The second open is for the return of Jesus Christ to this earth. Look with me please. Revelation 19 verse 11. And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in his righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. And he, that, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with vesture dripped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. Think with me for just a moment. What an awesome day this will be. Amen? Think about it. When Jesus arrives on earth the second time, the moment that his feet, you remember where it touched the Mount of Olives, the mountain was split apart, and the world will see him, and the world will recognize him as the true King of kings and Lord of lords. Think about that. All the world. Notice number three in your outline, the armies of Christ. The armies of Christ. When Jesus returned to earth to put down the world's rebellion, the armies of heaven are going to come. They're going to accompany him back to earth. John described these armies in verse 14 of chapter number 19. If you still have your Bibles open, glance at that verse for just a moment. Revelation 19, 14 says, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now hold your finger in the book of Revelation and turn back to the book of Jude. 
We're coming right back to Revelation, but flip back to Jude, verses 14 and 15. The Bible says from the book of Jude in verse 14, And Enoch also, the Sabbath from Adam prophesied of these sayings, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints. Now here's another picture that we're painting, telling you who's coming with him, with ten thousand of his saints. Why? Verse 15, look with me. To execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now I want you to note something in verse number 15. Jude used the word ungodly four times. Folks, the repetition is not accidental. Jude was emphasizing the fact that when Christ comes the second time, his long-suffering patient will have ran its course. Jesus is coming to impose judgment upon those who have defiled him, those who have made fun of him, those who have said no to him, those who have said they have no need for God or for God's word or for God's church. Plus, that judgment will be very massive. Let's move on. Look at Roman numeral number four. Notice the authority of Christ. The authority. If you belong to Jesus Christ, you're going to love this part here. When the Lord returns to earth at the end of the tribulation, the men and the women of the nations, all who have defiled Jesus, will no more be able to stand against Him. Those days will be gone. Those days will be over. His victory will be assured and His his authority will be undisputed. Now, I want you to note how John described Christ's judgment. In the book of Revelation 19, notice verse 15 and verse 16, please. Verse 15 says, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he should rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now the grand title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, identifies our Lord at his second coming. It speaks of one thing. It speaks of his authority. Some would say how. I like this. At his name. And only at His name. The Bible is telling us that every king, every person, rich and famous, poor, it doesn't matter, every person will bow and every Lord will kneel at His name. What a day that will be. Amen? In verse 15, let me explain the sword. The sword of judgment, a sharp instrument uh, of war which Jesus will smite the nations into submission and establish His absolute role. In other words, when He comes back, the second thing, He's going to make everything right. He's going to put everything in place. What a day that will be. Amen? What a day. Roman numeral number 5. Look with me. The avenging of Christ. The avenging. Something we must remember. The book of Revelation, and we've studied the book of Revelation, is divided into three sections. And let me explain this way. At the beginning of the book, we are introduced to the world ruined by people. And it seems like we continue to mess it up. Do you agree? We just keep on doing things that we shouldn't do. As we move to the latter half of the tribulation period, we see a different world. We see a world in that time period that is ruled by the old devil, that's ruled by Satan. And then we come to the uh, latter part, Christ's return at the end of the tribulation period. We see that a world that is reclaimed, and I'm so thankful, and I'm so glad a world that is reclaimed by Jesus Christ. There is a problem. Before the world can be reclaimed, it must be cleansed. That is what Christ will do before He reclaims the earth. All rebellion, all, must be rooted out. He must avenge the damage done to His perfect creation by wiping the rebels from the very face of the earth. In Revelation 19, look at verse 17. This is some very scary scripture. Verse 17 of Revelation 19 says, And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls, or to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. You might want to mark that supper. Verse 18. 
Why? That you may eat the flesh of the kings and the flesh of the captains and the flesh of the mighty men and the flesh of the horses and of them that set on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive, notice that word alive, into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Now that's an awful scene. <clears throat> Excuse me. These verses give us an account of the purging. They give us an account of the cleansing. Words are hardly adequate here to describe the horror of this awful scene that we've just read. The fowl of the air, of the earth's air, all gathered together at Armageddon and to feast on those massive piles. Now, think for just a moment. Massive piles of human beings, mainly. Think about maybe a World War I or World War II where you saw maybe pictures of bodies being stacked one on another. Nothing like what's going to happen at the end of time as far as bodies being stacked on one another. For not just a pile, but the Bible's telling us this is going to go on for miles and miles. The fowl of the air gathered together at Armageddon to feast upon these massive piles of human flesh that will litter the battlefield for miles and miles and miles. Now what kind of birds will this be? The words translated fowl or birds is found only three times in the entire Bible. Twice in Revelation 19, verse 17, 21, and then again in Revelation 18, 2. What does it mean? It is a Greek word which designates a scavenger bird, translated in English into one word, vulture. Vulture. Look back at verse 17 if you still have your Bibles open. The angel is calling to the vultures, to the vultures of the earth, to Armageddon, to the supper of the great God where they will feast on the fallen carcasses of the enemies of the Lord. Whom will the vultures, the vultures eat? Look at verse 18. The Bible says that these corpses include both the great and the small, the kings and the generals, both bond and free. Some of you have read in books by the author Harry Ironside, listen to one of his quotes. He said, and I'm quoting, it's an awful picture. The climax of man's resistance to God, end of quote. And I believe he saw it correctly. This is a sad picture that we've just read about. It's a very sad scene. It's an awful supper. Here are the people who have rejected Jesus Christ, God's Son, over and over and over. But what about the Christian supper? Did you notice it talks about two different ones? In Revelation 19, look back at verse 7. The Bible says in Revelation 19 verse 7, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him. For the marriage of the Lamb is to come and His wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Now the marriage supper of the Lamb is a time of great joy. It is going to be a time of great celebrating. I'm glad that I have confirmed my reservation for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Some people would say, Preacher, when did you do that? How did you do that? I'll never forget as a 12-year-old boy on the Thursday night in vacation Bible school at Whitnell First Baptist Church, I bowed my head and heart and prayed the sinner's prayer the very, the very best way that I knew how. I did not understand everything about salvation. I did not know anything about sanctification. I knew nothing about justification. I just knew that I needed to be saved, knew I was a sinner, and asked him to come into my heart the very best way that I could. 
made my reservation that night. All born again believers will feast at the table of heaven, but the other supper that we've read about, the supper of the great God, the human participants will be the food. Now, I know that sounds awful, but that's coming straight from God's word. Now, I want to pause and just ask a few questions. Which supper will you be attending? Have you made your reservations at the marriage supper of the Lamb? Have you prayed the sinner's prayer and accepted God's Son as your Lord and Savior? And as a Christian, are you ready to stand before God? In Revelation chapter 19, look again at verse 20. Revelation 19 verse 20. The Bible tells us that God simply snatches up the Antichrist, beast, and the false prophet and flings them into the fiery lake. There's something we must see in this verse. Both are alive, right? Is that what the Bible says? These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. Revelation 19.20. Now turn over to chapter 20. I want you to see something important here. In verse number 2 of chapter number 20, the Bible says, And he laid a hold on the old dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. And we could call him some other names, couldn't we? And bound him for a thousand years. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loose for a season. Now skip down to verse 10 of chapter 20. Verse 10 of chapter 20 the Bible says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Now read this very closely. Look at it closely. Where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and forever. And here's my point. Even after a thousand years of being in the lake of fire, even after being tormented day and night for a thousand years, we find the beast, the antichrist, and the false prophet, they're still alive. They're still being tormented. They're still suffering even after 1,000 years. Listen, if you die lost, as I said this morning, you're always going to be lost. If your family dies lost, your family that you love, if they die lost, they're going to always be lost. Christians will live forever and forever in a place called heaven with Jesus Christ. Lost folks, likewise, will live forever and forever in an awful place called hell. Listen, the Bible says with the Antichrist, with the false prophet, the devil, lost folks will want to die. Instead, they will be tormented. The Bible is reminding us for all eternity. I can hardly picture that. It's hard for me to even begin to comprehend how awful that will be. One last statement. The signs tell us that the second coming of Jesus is drawing near should motivate us as Christian men and women to confess our sin and to turn to God. Are you ready for His return? Are you ready to stand before God. God is good. Amen? He's so good. And we say that we love Him. And if we really love Him, we should live for Him. Amen? Somebody that you come in contact with should want what you have. Did you know that? Has that happened in your life? Has somebody asked you, you know, what have you got? What what makes you smile? What makes you so happy? Hopefully that they can see Jesus in you and see Jesus in me. Let's stand together as we pray together. Heavenly Father, you tell us much about the rapture and you tell us much about the second coming. We don't know everything especially the time but God, we do know that you're coming and that should motivate us to be looking and to be watching, to be listening. It should motivate us to make sure that we're in your will as Christian men and women, knowing that you could come even before the sun rises in the morning. God, help us to make sure that we're clean and in your will so that others would want what we have in Christ Jesus. Lord, this is your invitation. I do pray again if there's a lost person,